in keynote of the day. And before I do that, I just wanted to say, you know, I think it's a testament to ComsNet in sort of the diversity that our keynotes uh, re reflect. Because yesterday we had this, you know, really awesome talk by Professor Li Zhang, which was all about the core internet architecture and reimagining the architecture. And today, uh, we're very, very honored and pleased to have, uh, you know, Professor Krishna Gumadi from the Max Planck Institute of Software Systems. He's the head of the Network Systems Research Group there. Um, you know, sort of needs no introduction to a lot of people in the community. A lot of seminal work related to what I broadly describe as internet scale systems. Um, you know, um, just as a quick introduction, he did his undergrad here in IIT Madras. Yeah. And then a master's and PhD at the University of Washington. Um, well, many years ago by now. Uh, and since then, he's been doing a lot of very, very well-known work in internet scale systems, and most recently in what I call social computing systems, including things related to crowdsourcing, veracity of information, diffusion of information, you know, all of that stuff that he'll talk about today. And I'm really hoping that you know, when he comes onto the podium, he's finally going to solve the problem of fake news, uh, which really <laughs> is, you know, uh, will give him a certain perspective on this problem. But really, the uh, keynote talk today is all about social media and understanding it, and also understanding how advertisers target people and what you as consumers have the ability to control your privacy and you know, the amount of information you sort of share with people. So it's a very topical uh, subject, and I'm sort of delighted to have you here, Krishna. So over to you. Let's welcome uh, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for the, for the kind introduction. Um, can everybody hear me well? OK, sounds good. OK, I'm going to dive um, into the uh, topic today, which is about targeted advertising on social media. So um, this is actually a work done by a number of different PhD students, um, as well as postdoctoral researchers, as well as former alumni of Max Planck Institute for Software Systems. Um, so the people in the green are the students who did all the hard work, and the people in the red are the cheerleaders. And I'm one of them. Um, so what I'm going to focus today is on ad targeting in social media. And in particular, throughout the talk, to just to make this very concrete, I'm going to focus on Facebook, social media platform. Now, the reason why I'm going to focus on Facebook is because it's by far the largest social media platform in terms of number of users, the data aggregated on the users, in terms of advertisers, as well as ad revenues. And it's also, as I'm going to show, um, is a leader in introducing novel and provocative um, ad targeting practices as well, which are then copied by the rest of the industry. Now, however, um, even though I'm not going to bring this up um, again throughout the rest of the talk, many of the issues that I'm going to raise here actually generalize to pretty much most social media platforms that are out there, like LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, as well as other types of data brokers like Google, Axiom, and so on as well. Okay? So before I dive into the questions um, that, uh, about ad targeting, let me give you guys a brief background on how ad targeting actually works on Facebook, because many of you may not be familiar with this. Now, in case you don't know, um, uh, Facebook's basic revenue model is through advertisements, right? So you see a ton of advertisements whenever you log into Facebook. You see them in the newsfeed as well as on the side as well. Now, the thing that we're actually interested in is what sort of data is Facebook gathering about users to enable advertisers to target ads at them, right? Now, it shouldn't be surprising, but Facebook gathers a lot of data about, uh, about all of us. Um, but what might, be, um, might not have been well recognized is how many different types of information Facebook gathers about us. So you, you can broadly think of the types of data that Facebook gathers into three categories. One is behaviors, another is your interests, and the third is your demographics. So your demographics includes information like your education levels, your, whether your parents, whether you have kids, what your financial um, status might be, what your relation status is, and so on. Now, when it comes to interests, they have things like whether you're interested in technology or sports or, um, or food and drink and those kinds of things. And then Facebook also gathers your behaviors, like um, whether you're a kind of your purchasing behavior. Are you a kind of a person who would buy luxury goods or things like that? Now, what is interesting is Facebook gets this data in two different ways. One is it, you provide Facebook a ton of data whenever you log in and, and, you, and you post things and you click on 
websites. Uh, and beyond what you do on Facebook, Facebook also partners with a ton of different types of data aggregators that are out there. Now, how many of you have heard of companies like Axiom, Experian, Data Logics, or Epsilon? Show of hands. Okay. For those of you who don't know what these companies are, these are actually data broker companies that gather your credit card transactions and actually mine them for various different types of information. These are what are typically thought of as offline data brokers. And what Facebook has done is actually it partnered with them and ended up linking your online accounts to those to the credit card data that these companies have. Um, so at least in the US, 80% um, of all Facebook accounts are already linked with uh, data from these data brokers. So Facebook has a lot of information about you, not just about what you do online, but also offline. Now, let me just quickly um, give you a feel for the types of features or how detailed these features are. So for instance, under the demographic features, um, one of them is relationship. And under relationship, it, is, it has the subcategories of are you a man interested in um, woman or whether you're a man interested in man and so on, right? Your relation, your uh, sexual interest. And you, it also has information about your status, which is whether you're separated, widowed, open relationship, divorce, complicated, whatever else. You can see the fine grain, uh, fine granularity at which Facebook tries to infer your features. Now, uh, at the risk of sounding very um, nerdy, each user feature is a Boolean variable. There is a reason why this is important um, for the, in, the, in the later part of the talk. So everything is either zero or one. If Facebook thinks you are um, widowed, it will be zero. It will be one. If not, it's zero. Now. And that, at another example of demographical features, one that it gathers from data brokers is financial. So for instance, this is, um, these are categories in Germany where they're basically dividing users into whether they're um, based on their monthly net income between 2,000, 2,600 euros or 5,000 euros or more than 5,000 euros. You get the picture. Now of course, the amount of data that Facebook aggregates varies across different countries. And this is a table that shows um, the types, the number of features that it infers um, in various countries. As you can see, the US is the country where Facebook infers the most amount of information. So in general, Facebook infers about 598 features about all users across all the countries. But in terms of their um, matching or their aggregation with um, other types of data aggregators, it's most prevalent in the US. Um, in India, at least luckily, um, Facebook hasn't yet partnered with any of these um, data brokers, offline data brokers. I don't know if it's because they don't have enough information or whether there are some laws that would prevent them from doing that kind of aggregation. But you can see that um, in, in general, in the US and UK, it's highest. In European countries, there is still some amount of um, aggregation or linking with um, offline um, data sources that happens. Like for instance, in Germany, um, Facebook partners with Axiom. Um, but then there are also some advanced countries like in Canada where I suspect primarily because of privacy laws, there are no, no such aggregation takes place, okay? Now, let's quickly look at how Facebook allows advertisers to target users. Now, Facebook uses all this data that I just showed, um, and it enables advertisers to use them in two different ways. The first is what, let me call it as traditional targeting, where advertisers essentially specify a Boolean formula over the features. Essentially, you say, I want to target all people with feature one and feature two and feature three, or feature four and so on. So typically the formula uh, that advertisers provide is in a restricted CNF form. Like it is a formula of this type where essentially what we're showing is um, this advertiser wants to target everyone with a certain number of features and certain other types of features and not having certain types of features, right? Now again, this might seem very nerdy, but there is a reason why I'm showing this that it is actually a Boolean formula. Uh, that advertisers specify, even though they might not think in those terms. Now, a user um, is targeted whenever the feature vector that they have essentially satisfies the formula, right? So whenever the, uh, you plug in the Boolean values that you have for the different features into the formula, if it is one, you get targeted. If it's zero, you don't get targeted, right? Now, this is, the, this is one of the ways in which Facebook targets. Then there is a separate, a new way in which Facebook also allows um, audience targeting, and it's called custom audience targeting. This is a new feature that Facebook introduced about three to four years ago, and it's actually very provocative. So what it allows is advertisers can actually upload personally identifying information about users they wish to target. So if I can just upload a list of phone numbers or email IDs or some information about name, date of birth, and your address, I can put them in a text file, upload it to Facebook, and target those people who um, who match those things. So as you can see here, 
Um, you can essentially uh, provide emails or phone numbers or, um, or first name, last name, zip code, and Facebook then matches with the data that it has about you, and if it matches, then it allows you to target, okay? Now, um, this custom audience targeting is something that became very popular. Facebook introduced it first, and since then, other companies like Instagram, Twitter, Google, everyone also introduced. So this is the one where you're really using some individual information, personally identifying information you know about users to target them, okay? Now, this is the background. Now we, let's get into the meat of the talk. What I'm going to do is talk about four different aspects of ad targeting. First is transparency, second is control, third is fairness, and fourth is privacy. Now, I structured my talk so that I can actually end the talk at any, at the, at any of these things if we don't have enough time to get through all the four. Uh, but I would encourage, highly encourage you to ask questions even in the middle, okay? Feel free to interrupt me if something is not um, clear to you. We don't need to get to the end. Um, because we can stop it at any of these points. Now, we did some preliminary work, uh, published some preliminary work in each of the, in three of these four topics. Um, if you want to look in, into them for more details, feel, um, feel free to afterwards. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that we have barely scratched the surface um, on each of these points. Um, and the talk, is, I structured the talk so that actually there are more questions that I'm going to raise um, than answers that I would provide. And hopefully it'll get, some of you will be interested in pursuing some of these directions um, in the future as well, okay? So, let me start with transparency. So the key question that we wanted to ask under transparency is, can I, as a Facebook user, know what data about me is being used to target ads at me, okay? It's a basic question. Now, let's think of how Facebook, uh, what type of transparency Facebook provides about ad targeting. Now, to give credit to Facebook, where it is due, Facebook is actually one of the first companies that started providing explanations for ads. So for instance, this is an ad that I saw on my Facebook newsfeed at about 6.30 a.m. this morning, and it's actually some ad targeting me for sending money to India. Now, you can, for every ad that Facebook shows you, you can go to the top right corner, and there is a small arrow there, and if you click it, it actually gives you um, a thing, a button to click on which says, why am I seeing this ad? And when I clicked on this, this is the explanation that Facebook gave me. It says, one of the reasons I was seeing this ad because Facebook thinks that I'm an expat from India that is age 21 or older who is living in Germany, and that's why it is targeting me with this ad saying, would you want to send money to India? Now these explanations are largely voluntary, um, though in certain countries they're necessary for, to satisfy legal um, requirements. Now the question that I wanted to ask um, is, explanations are great, but are they complete? Are they correct? Are they personalized? That means, does Facebook give me one explanation for the ad and a different person a different explanation for the ad? Are they deterministic? Meaning, if I see the same ad again and again, would I be given the same reason or would I be given different explanations? Are they useful? Meaning, once I got this explanation, what can I do with it? Can I somehow go and change some privacy settings? where I, if I removed my, uh, the, my status as an expat from India, would I stop getting the ad? These kinds of things, right? Now, as you can know, even from day-to-day um, -day common sense, whenever you ask somebody for an explanation, you can give, offer anything as an explanation. But the important thing is, we need standards for explanations. Because if not, you can very easily end up in a scenario where you have adversarial explanations, which are insufficient or unsatisfactory explanations that offer no insight for actionable information to consumers. It could be like a politician's answer to a question. It has no content, it's just like not that insightful or, or useful. Or in the worst case, you could even have misleading or fake explanations where sometimes Facebook might have given this explanation which is not even correct, but just to make me feel happy. Maybe um, if it instead, if that ad was actually targeted because of something else, because Facebook actually had my financial information, uh, and maybe it is showing this expats India thing as an explanation rather than the financial information, because it's, it makes me feel less spooked, right? So this is a reason why we, why we need standards for explanations. And so what I'm going to do next is examine whether the explanations that Facebook offers are actually complete. So in the paper, we actually go through all those properties and we check whether the explanations are complete, correct, uh, deterministic, personalized, and so on. But I'm going to focus primarily on two of them, which is whether they're complete and whether they're correct. So here is 
So what we did is we actually gathered um, a bunch of explanations that we received for various different types of ads um, over a period of several months. So all the people, all the authors um, of this project, we installed some plugin um, and gathered the explanations that we were seeing for all the ads. And so I'm going to show you some of the explanations that we got. So there were some ads that we received. Um, for instance, Booking.com once targeted me with um, using custom audience. That means Booking.com, I'm guessing that um, when I logged in and when I uh, signed up for a hotel, they used my email ID or something. But if you look at the explanation that Facebook gives, it just simply says that some customer information was used by Booking.com to target. But notice that this explanation is somewhat um, incomplete in the sense that it is actually not showing what PII Booking.com actually used. That means, did Booking.com use my email number, email ID, or did it use my phone number, or did it use my name and address? Because Booking.com, whenever I go to it, it asks me to give all these kinds of information. But so Facebook definitely knows this information because without that information, it couldn't have been, it couldn't be targeting ads at me. But it's somehow not revealing the full story. And the same thing happens even for information that it gets from data brokers. So for instance, once I got this ad saying that um, this ad from Peugeot is being targeted at me because of data provided by Axiom. Look at the words in blue. Now, Axiom has mostly financial information, but Facebook is actually not saying whether it is targeting me because it got some ac from Axiom the information that I'm earning a certain amount of um, salary or, or income, and that's the reason why I was being targeted. Once again, the explanation feels incomplete because it doesn't state what Axiom, da what Axiom provided data was actually used. For instance, is it based on financial data or is it based on my purchasing habit? Now, we looked at other types of ads um, and explanations that Facebook provides, and here is basically what we noticed. For every ad as an explanation, Facebook typically provides location, gender, and age as possible reasons, and beyond that, it, ex it picks exactly one of the features used in the, ta in the targeting formula, that means we never saw a Facebook explanation that says you were targeted because of more than one feature. So for instance, the typical format of Facebook explanations are that one reason you're seeing the ad and it specifies one feature, and then it says there may be other reasons, and then typically what are included in the other reasons are information about location, gender, and age, and that's it, right? So clearly these explanations are, are incomplete because we gathered data about hundreds of ads and in no ad did we ever see um, an explanation beyond one feature. Now to confirm this further, what we did was we ran controlled ads. So what we did was we ran ads targeting ourselves. We signed up as advertisers on Facebook and targeted ourselves, and we looked at the explanations that Facebook gave us. And because we knew what um, features we used to target ourselves, this would enable us to check whether the explanations are complete and whether they are correct. And here is what we found. We actually um, ran a controlled ad using two features, millennials and expats, as um, the features of the people that we wanted to target. I'm not a millennial, but my student is. Um, and so he got this ad, and when he looked at the explanations that he got, it only talked about he being a millennial. Ah, millennial. And the fact that he was an expat, um, that feature also being used was completely excluded. It gave only one of the features. So only one feature, not all, are actually shown. Now here comes the real kicker. The worst is that actually, Facebook added to that explanation another explanation saying, there may be other reasons why you're seeing this advertisement. It's because your people aged 18 and above and who live or recently have been in Germany. Now this is a feature that we never use in the targeting in the first place. So one way to look at this is that Facebook completely made up this explanation because we didn't use it to target the people. Or the second thing is maybe um, Facebook is hiding under this word, maybe other reasons. So using the word maybe other reasons, does it make the, the, the explanation, maybe it is too harsh to call it incorrect because they said maybe uh, kind of a thing. But on the other hand, Facebook knows precisely what data we use to target people. And they're somewhat, it's kind of funny that they're playing these kinds of games. Now, it's kind of strange that they're actually used, uh, they're using features that were never used in the targeting in the first place. Yes, they may be, yep. So, so millennials are actually people um, who are born in after 85 or 84 kind of a thing, right? 
So actually, it doesn't make sense to say people aged 18 and above because it would have made more sense to say people aged less than some, some amount, right? So this is, this is some explanation that, that Facebook is making up. And in some sense, another way to look at this is Facebook is adding this explanation to every single thing. Now, I don't know why they're doing it. Maybe it be, it's because people feel, find it less spooky or feel more satisfied because they feel like, oh, it's telling me, it's giving me some explanation. But it's strange because this was never even used. We never even specified anything about location um, and, or that being Germany or the age in, in and of itself. Okay? Now, um, now, let's actually ask this question, whether Facebook's explanations need to be complete, whether they should have specified all features in the first place. Now, there, to be fair, there are both arguments for and against it. The arguments for specifying all the features is that it avoids misleading or fake explanations, because you know exactly what are all the features that are used. Now, on the, um, and that would actually build trust um, amongst users. Now, the arguments against might be that somebody might argue that the targeting formula is a business secret, and besides, if some business actually specifies a very long Boolean formula to target users, giving users the Boolean formula might just overload them with information. Um, and what this would argue for is then giving some succinct explanations, right, like summaries, um, one or two um, the, of the most important features. Now, how does actually Facebook pick the features for explanations? So when you see an explanation like this, uh, like some uh, advertiser like Peek and Klopen Klopenberg targeted me for because I was interested in shopping and, uh, and fashion, are the explained features, are the, are the few features that Facebook is picking, are they the most important ones, right? That's an interesting question. So what we did was, again, we tried to reverse engineer how Facebook actually is selecting explanation, um, features to explain. So what we did was we ran a number of different types of controlled ads targeting ourselves with various different combinations of features to see which features are Facebook, is Facebook actually prioritizing um, when it is showing these things. And what we found was that Facebook seems to prioritize features in the following order. Um, the first is it looks at the features and the type of the feature that is, like whether it is a demographic feature or is an interest feature or a PII, which is like a personally identifying information or a behavioral feature. And then it gives the demographic uh, features first if they were ever used in the ad targeting thing. Now here is the really strange thing. There was a, there is a, paper that was published um, at Usenix Security um, last year that where they actually asked users which features they think is most privacy sensitive. That means which features would actually spook them out most. This was an academic uh, paper. And what they found was most people felt that they would be spooked if it was a behavioral feature. And the features that spook them the least are the demographic features. Like if, if you are told that you're being targeted because you're a man or a woman, um, and those kinds of things, and you're of your age, people feel less spooked than when it is something like, oh, be because you are actually one of the craziest um, behavioral feature in Facebook is whether, you, whether or not people have foot fetish, um, if you know what it means. Uh, so those kinds of behavioral features really, really, really uh, spook people out. But Facebook is, in terms of its explanations, is doing the, exactly the opposite of what um, people actually think or find privacy sensitive. And the second thing that Facebook does is it, provides the feature that is most prevalent amongst the audience, amongst the Facebook users, um, as an explanation. Now just think about this. If you're being targeted because you have feature one or feature two, and feature one is something like gender, which is, which is shared by like 50% of the people in the population, versus another feature that is shared by only 5% of the people in the population, which one would you want to, to know? Facebook would prioritize this, the more prevalent one rather than the less prevalent one, which is somehow more distinguishing feature of yours than others. So it's very, very unclear whether this is the right prioritization of the features in, as part of explanations. So here are some open challenges. Um, how, to, how should actually Facebook pick um, a few features for explanations? How should Facebook determine the importance of a user feature? Now here, you could have various different ways of prioritization. One is whether it's actually revealing privacy sensitive information, or a second thing could be um, how rare the feature is in the population. Or the third thing could be how much influence does it exert in terms of sizing the target audience? Um, or in terms of other kinds of um, notions of influence of a feature, um, there is a very interesting paper that um, was published by folks from CMU um, and they call it the quantifying input influence, where what they talk of is you could measure the importance of a feature in a formula, 
by looking at if you remove that feature from the Boolean formula, you end up picking a different set of people, right? Now you could look at how much influence a feature has in sizing the audience, because by remo if you remove the feature, if the size of the audience would increase by a factor of two or 10, that means that would end up determining how influential that, paper, uh, that, that feature is in, um, in decreasing the size of the audience, and that could be a different way in which you could uh, prioritize features. Now, it's very unclear what the um, right priority here should be, and in some sense, I look at these questions as actually open questions. Now, the study that we have done actually hopefully um, raises at least a few questions in some of you that it's worth thinking about what, how explanations should actually be constructed. Um, but actually constructing explanations that offer some interesting, um, that meet some interesting standards is actually an open question. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Um, the, we are actually trying to, uh, one could argue that the uh, correct explanation is one that is complete. But on the other hand, um, the problem with a complete explanation could be that if somebody is targeting, say, feature, like males, some feature one, feature two, feature three, to feature n, right? And you satisfied the formula because you had only one feature, it might not be even useful for you to know all the other features in the formula because you don't even have it, right? So for instance, actually when we started the project, um, we were convinced that Facebook's explanation shouldn't be personalized. And actually, Facebook's explanations are personalized. That means for the same ad and the same targeting formula, you would get a different explanation than Ranjit, right? Now, we were actually convinced by the end of the study that actually they deserve to be personalized because suppose if I targeted some ad saying F1 or F2, and you satisfy F1, and she satisfies F2, and, you, and you're receiving the ad because you're satisfying different features, it does make sense to say you're being targeted because of F1 and F2 rather than give the same explanation to each, both. So there are some very nuances to, once you start thinking about what would be a, the right explanation, there's some pretty nuances, uh, pretty interesting nuances that come up. I have a question about how targeting works or how it's supposed to work. Is it a strict requirement or is there some relaxation happening? For example, if I, uh, if I target something where no one in the world satisfies it, will my ad never be shown or will it still be shown to people who satisfy some parts of my target? Because you know that might explain some of your findings. Yeah. So one thing that we haven't, um, so when you're, you're actually hinting at a, a more interesting thing. If you look at the bigger picture of like how ads are targeted, there are the two phases, right? And the phase one is when um, you even satisfy the advertiser's requirement for being shown the ad. And the second thing is actually showing the ad. For you to see the ad, it would, you would actually go through an ad auction process and there is a, a different thing of like whether or not you're logged in and those things also affecting. Now, I'm right now what, we're, what um, we are pretending is that the explanation is more about the targeting itself, right? But it is true that the ad auction process might actually play in, might be playing a role and maybe some of these features are being shown because those are the features um, because of some intricacies of the ad auction process that we are currently ignoring. But the targeting process is strict, is it? Is yes, the targeting process is strict. They will not relax it at all. So even if no sure. one satisfies your tar uh, target thing, uh, if no one satisfies the specified ta uh, targeting criterion, you will so not show the ad? Is that how, how it works? Yes, yes, uh, because Facebook has, each one of these features is a Boolean feature. It's not even like a continuous feature or anything. It's either zero or one. And the advertiser, if you look at the Facebook ad interface, they actually specify, we want to target people that satisfy this formula or that or that kind of a thing. I'll take one more question and then because somebody has raised the hand uh, behind and yeah. then I will move on and um, I'll get back to more questions at the end. Th there seems to be a one-to-one -one correlation you're drawing between explanation and targeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk to publishers, the explanation which Facebook gives them regarding the targeting is quite different from what they give the consumers, right? Consumer seems to be more of an exclusion mm -hmm. criteria a broad exclusion criteria, but when it comes to publishers, they give a very detailed uh, analysis and explanation. So um, the one-to-one -one correlation between explanation and targeting doesn't seem, um, seem to be so accurate, especially because you're looking at explanations for consumers, which is different from what they give publishers. You're absolutely right. Actually, um, another way to think about what we're hinting at here is 
explanations can be offered at various different levels, right? So an advertiser might actually be thinking of certain things, certain reasons for why they're targeting uh, people in a particular way, right? So for instance, there was an instance when we ran Facebook ads targeting um, people interested in computer science, undergrad students in computer science, right? And then when we ran the ads first, without distinguishing based on gender, we realized that we noticed that, in, that most of our ads were being shown to, for whatever reason, male uh, computer science students. Then, and the percentage of female computer science students who were seeing them were very few. So then we actually ended up targeting two separate campaigns. We ended up running two separate campaigns, one targeting male computer science students and another targeting female computer science students. So as an advertiser, we have some very interesting reasons for constructing those targeting campaigns. Now, explaining that is even more difficult. I would agree. So in fact, one of the, in fact, a very hot topic these days is actually constructing explanations for algorithmic um, systems where, um, and you're hinting at a problem that comes at, at the level of, at what level should explanations be uh, provided. Now in this particular work, as well as here, what we're focusing is on the explanation that Facebook is giving one of their users for why they're seeing their ad, right? And there, I, I do think it is okay to narrowly focus on um, what features about the users that Facebook knows is actually leading to they being shown the ad. Now I know that that's narrowing down the scope of the explanations, but I feel like that's a reasonable one in this particular case, but your point is well taken, that explanations may have to be offered at different levels, okay? Now, that's the first part of the talk about transparency. Um, that is, can I know what data about me is being used to target the ads? And the answer is no, only some, but not all data is revealed. And it's unclear what's the right way to actually show the limited amount of data. Next, let me quickly talk about control. Now, what I mean by control is, do the explanations offer consumers satisfactory control? Now, you can offer explanations for two different reasons. One is to make someone feel good about it, right? Sometimes somebody asks, why did you do this to me? You give an explanation to satisfy them mentally and psychologically. Another thing is you give an explanation that actually op offers um, the user some way to control the outcomes. That means when somebody asks, why did I not get selected for a particular grant or, or why did your paper not get in to ComSnet, there is a different thing where you can give an explanation that would tell them, oh, maybe you should do this thing better, right? That's what I call as useful explanations are the ones that enable control. Now let's look at whether the explanations that Facebook offers actually enable consumer control over the ads. Now when we're talking about control, it's important to distinguish between two different types of controls. One is you can control the inputs that is what data about you is being used to target ads. And the second thing is to control the outputs. That means sometimes you may not care what data is being used um, to target the ads, but you might say, I want to receive ads that are related to jobs in technology, right? That's the outputs that you might want to control. Um, or you may not want to receive ads that are related to certain other things. And notice that there is a clean distinction between inputs and outputs. Now Facebook, proclaims that it actually offers end users controls. In fact, it has a page called Ad Preferences page where it says it, this offers you control over what ads you see. But actually that's misleading because what they're actually doing is if they're only offering um, controls over inputs and not outputs. You can't tell, I want to see ads related to technology or from Microsoft or Google. You can only control the inputs to the thing. Now, let's just think for a second about what do you need to do to construct explanations that offer users output control. Now given that the explanations are incomplete, if you really wanted to control the outcomes, you have to ask the questions, are the explained features necessary to receive the ad? Now what do I mean by necessary? That means if you look at this explanation that Peek and Kloppenberg is targeting me because of shopping and fashion, if this was a necessary um, explanation, what it would mean is if I asked Facebook to remove the the fact that I'm interested in shopping and fashion, then I should not receive the ad, right? That would be a necessary subset of features. Now, at least in Facebook, there is no guarantee that if I remove shopping and fashion, I would, I would stop receiving these ads because I could, be, I could still be targeted because I'm satisfying the formula in a different way. Or you could ask the questions, are the explained features sufficient? Now, a sufficient condition, what it would mean is if I asked Facebook to change the data on features other than shopping and fashion, if I changed anything, everything else, would I still continue to receive the ad on Peek and Kloppenberg? Now, 
For those of you who are familiar with understanding the, the distinction between necessary and sufficient conditions, these might be some interesting conditions that the explained features might have to satisfy if you really want to control the outputs of um, the ads that you receive, right? Now, once again, in Facebook there are no guarantees, but let me tell you some very interesting challenges that come up if you try to construct explanations that actually are necessary or sufficient. Keep in mind that the explanations are being constructed automatically. There is no user sitting there and giving an explanation for every ad that, that people see, right? But here comes the really interesting thing, technically speaking. It's actually technically challenging to construct necessary and sufficient explanations for targeting formulae. And if you're wondering why, because if you think of the problem of finding the minimum set of necessary or sufficient features, it actually translates to the NP-complete Boolean satisfiability problem. And that was the reason why I was talking about the, uh, the ad targeting formula being a Boolean formula. So you have a Boolean formula, you have a feature, set of features that is leading you to satisfy the formula. And if you want to figure out the smallest set of necessary or sufficient features um, that would enable you to continue to receive the ads or not receive the ads, which is about controlling outputs, you would have to solve a satisfiability problem. In fact, one of my students is actually using SAT solvers to see if they could, we could actually um, construct um, necessary or sufficient explanations. So, the point I wanted to make is actually to think of, to think of um, utility of an explanation as one that enables you to control the outcomes and not just control the inputs. And if you wanted to do that, and if you wanted to have control over outcomes, you would have to, to offer satisfactory control, you would have to construct explanations that are actually computationally non-trivial to construct. Okay? Now that's the second part of the thing about the control. Now, notice that even though I'm talking about these in the context of ads, you can expand these questions to pretty much any algorithmic or machine learning um, uh, driven system out there where you could ask what standards are the explanations satisfying and how to construct explanations that offer end users control, okay? Now, let me move on to a different topic, which is fairness. That is, can we detect and prevent discriminatory ad targeting? Now, the first question you might be having is, can ad targeting be discriminatory? Um, the, here are some canonical examples of discriminatory ads. Um, now, by definition, whenever you're targeting ads to a subgroup of people, you are clearly differentiating between the people who deserve to get their ads and who don't. But certain kinds of differentiation would constitute discrimination. Now, to understand when um, a differentiation constitutes discrimination, Take this example of a CMU study that showed that um, online ads, particularly, I believe these are ads on Times of India, um, actually the job ads there target men um, when they are high paying um, and few women when they are high paying uh, job ads. Now, this, has, this, has, this was actually a very prominent example that, um, that concerned a lot of people um, about discrimination in ads. And more recently, there was another incident when actually um, uh, some researchers found that Facebook has a feature um, called ethnic affinity, uh, which identifies whether um, someone in the U.S. has an African-American ethnic affinity or a Hispanic ethnic affinity or a Asian if ethnic affinity. And what this means is you could actually run ads related to housing, loans, and mortgages, excluding people of a particular race. Now, in the U.S., there are laws um, for certain kinds of ads, those that are related to housing, um, loans, um, credit cards, and um, a couple of other things that are uh, where if you're running an ad related to them, you cannot actually base it on race. Um, and that would be prohibited by law. So actually what happened was the researchers who discovered this um, wanted to force Facebook to eliminate um, ethnic affinity as a feature, and so they targeted themselves. Um, they had ran some ads that are based on ethnic affinity and then sued um, Facebook as violating um, the the loss by enabling them to do that kind of discrimination. Now, when they did this, Facebook's first defense was ethnic affinity is not the same as ethnicity. So what they were saying was, look, we said ethnic affinity, and one of the first things they did was they changed the name to multicultural affinity. And what we mean by uh, African-American affinity is somebody is interested in African-American culture or Hispanic culture, and not that they are African-American or Hispanic, right? Now, what we thought was, can we verify how correlated these two things are, right? And here we thought, Heck, we know how to use Facebook ad API, so why not use them to actually check the correlation? So here is what we did. 
in the US, there are voter ID records are completely public in across all the states. So voter ID records identify a person in many states, particularly the one that we targeted was North Carolina. We just send them $10 and they sent us voter ID records corresponding to all the people who are registered to vote. Um, and this has information about their name, um, date of birth, um, address, which we could use to then target them on Facebook. Um, and then, in additionally, we also have their race information in the voter ID record. So that's our ground truth information. And then what we did was we, um, what I'm showing in this table are actually some numbers. So we had like um, millions of uh, people who are white and uh, we had about 1.6 million people in the voter ID records who were black. And what we did was we randomly selected 10,000 from uh, voter records from each one of these races. And then we actually used the information like name and address and we uploaded them to Facebook to target them, right? And Facebook matched like about 80% of them across the board, like because uh, Facebook is very widely prevalent in the US. And then what we looked at was amongst those 80% of, of the people that matched, what percentage of them were actually had ethnic affinity that corresponded to their ethnicity, right? To identify the correlation. And not surprisingly, what we found was that, for instance, 83% um, of, or close to 84% of whites um, or, uh, actually had white, um, uh, Caucasian ethnic affinity, and 83% um, of blacks had African American affinity. So Facebook's explanation that um, its ethnic affinity is not ethnicity is a is strictly speaking true, but it's kind of misleading because it's very, very he heavily correlated. But then this raises the question, if using, if correlations are what are making the ads discriminatory, does simply banning ethnic affinity help, right? Because beyond ethnic affinity, there may be tons of other features that are correlated. Because remember, Facebook is gathering 1,100 features, right? So there can be tons of other features that are correlated with race, that are as correlated with race as ethnic affinity, now, shouldn't Facebook be literally banning all of those from being used um, for targeting ads if they really wanted to prevent discrimination? Now, that's what we check next. Um, so here are some of the correlated features with African Americans. So what I'm showing here is the feature name. And maybe the most interesting thing to focus on is the last column, which, I'm, which is labeled as ratio. And what that ratio is, is if you use that feature to select um, users from the US population, what is the proportion, um, uh, what is the relative proportions of, uh, in this particular case, African Americans compared to the rest of the population that would be selected as part of that feature, right? So what this number seven, ratio seven means is if you targeted people with using African American ethnic affinity feature, then seven times, blacks are seven times, or African Americans are seven times more likely to be selected than the rest of the population. Now notice that actually you start seeing very, very stereotypical features ending up being correlated. So for instance, if you targeted people interested in gospel music, you'll be targeting African Americans three and a half times more than the rest of the population. And the same thing with, um, for instance, in at least in the state of North Carolina, if you started targeting people who are very liberal, um, there, the chance that African Americans would be targeted in that population is almost close, is 6.44 times more than anybody outside of it. And you can see similar things for um, Caucasians as well. Like if, if you wanted to, or if you wanted to exclude African Americans, you, should, you could use features like interest in hiking and, and camping. And we did this for other races as well. And, and it's really crazy like how stereotypical it comes, um, it comes up uh, being. Like for instance, if you wanted to target or exclude Asian Americans, the best thing is to target interest in, in architecture and engineering. Um, and so, at least in the, states of North, in, in the state of North Carolina, which shouldn't be surprising, but, but the point that actually, here is the open challenge, um, because what these people pointed out was a real problem, that there are features that can be used to exclude people of certain groups for running certain ads that are of vital social interest, right? Now, the question is how to detect discriminatory targeting in ads, given that how complicated the picture becomes once you start realizing that these features are, have very, very strange sorts of correlations with races, right? And because Facebook has lots of features, you have lots of opportunities to construct discriminatory ads. Now, an even more challenging problem is how to avoid discriminatory targeting in ads. Now, avoiding discrimination, algorithmic discrimination, is a very hot topic in, in and of, of itself, broadly speaking. But in the context of ads, it poses even more unique challenges. Because even if you manage to target ads in fair proportion, like as I was giving you previously an example where we as an advertiser 
um, ran ads targeting computer science students, and we have no, in, in fact, we wanted to not discriminate between men and women, right? Like male and, and female computer science students. We targeted all of them, but somehow when it came to, when it came to showing of the ad impressions, more of our ads were shown to men than to women. Now, we don't know why. Now, our suspicion is that maybe the pricing, because keep in mind that if you want to target someone, there is an ad auction process that your ad should go through, right? And, the, and in many places, the, if you wanted to target women, they're more expensive to target. I don't know why, but you, you can actually see on Facebook how expensive it is to target people of different demographics. Maybe there are more advertisers interested in targeting women in the, in the specific countries that we were advertising, which means that to be fair, it's not just enough to target 100 women and 100 men, but we might want to actually run separate campaigns with separate amount of campaign budgets and adjusting those budgets to actually make sure that the ad impressions are being, um, are being uh, fair. So all that I'm, as you notice, notice that these are all open challenges. We don't know the solutions for this. What I just presented is actually the, how complicated the problem is. Um, and I think actually looking at this might be interesting in the future. Okay? So, I talked about transparency, I talked about control, and I talked about fairness. Let me talk briefly about privacy. Now, are there privacy risks with targeted ads? Now, at this point, it might sound almost meaningless, but I'll tell you in a second why this is, um, you probably know the answer, yes, but I'll tell you, let me tell you why, uh, what kind of privacy risk these things pose. Now, to understand the privacy risks, I need to tell you about another feature of Facebook advertising interface, which is one where it gives advertisers an estimate of how many people you can reach um, with your ads, right? So for instance, this is the kind of an ad interface that you see. Um, so here you can actually specify your ad targeting features, like your detail targeting. You can pick all sorts of demographic interests and, and personal um, and behavioral features that you want to target. You can tell, you can specify what age groups you want to target, what gender, what location, all these kinds of things. But the more interesting thing is for us in this part of the talk is actually the estimate that Facebook gives here where it is showing that with these kinds of features, the potential reach is 2,000 people, right? So it is giving an estimate of the number of people that actually satisfy the targeting, the targeting formula. Now, the thing that I want to focus is what are the privacy risks with these audience estimates, right? To understand this, let's for the moment assume that the audience estimates are exact. That means you specify the Boolean formula and it tells you exactly um, how many people satisfy. Or you upload a list of phone numbers and it tells you exactly how many people um, Facebook matches. Then if you take a user's PII, like their phone number or an email ID, so if I wanted to know if Ram um, was on Facebook, I would just take his phone number or his email ID, I will upload it, and Facebook, if it tells one, then I know that it's, he's on Facebook. If it is zero, then he's not on Facebook, right? That I can do. Now actually worse is I can then actually link various different types of PIIs, that is, um, that Ram has on Facebook. That means I can start with his email ID and I can figure out his phone number. Here is how I would do it. I would, let me tell you the, the base brute force strategy. I would take every possible phone number in India and I would add Ram, I would upload Ram with each one of the phone numbers and if both of them match to the same users, I'll get an estimate of one. If it's two different users, I'll get two, right? So I can actually brute force the search because Facebook, when there are two PIAs that match to the same user, it counts as one, right? So that way I can actually link um, a email ID to phone numbers. Now you might think, wait, this is just crazy because you're never going to be able to upload as many lists. It turns out that you actually don't have to do that. You can actually do binary search over it. That means I can take a list of all, phone, all possible phone numbers that start with digit zero, all possible phone numbers that start with digit one, I create two separate lists. I, I then add Ram's thing or name or, or his email ID to it. I'll see the number, how the estimates are changing. And based on that, I can figure out what the first digit of his phone number. And then I will take log n of those, which is in the order of like 70 or 80. And then I can get his phone number, entire phone number. By the way, this attack we actually carried out. This is actually possible. So you can actually link up um, email IDs to, to phone numbers this way, right? Now I'm omitting the details, but you can look them up in, the, in our uh, Oakland SNP paper um, where we actually show um, how we carried out this attack. Now why is it dangerous to link PIIs? Now here are some, if you happen to live in one of those countries where, um, that have, where the governments actually ask people to link accounts, uh, Facebook accounts with phone numbers because they don't like their Facebook posts, um, then you are in trouble. Like for instance, here is an example where 
actually, the government of Pakistan actually asked Facebook to turn over um, some Facebook accounts that posted blasphemous posts um, um, to their mobile numbers. And the reason why they asked it is because in Pakistan, every mobile number is actually tied um, to um, individual users, um, like their passport name IDs or other kinds of things. Now, I don't know if it is the same in India, but when you have regimes that want to go after people based on their social media posts, and you have mobile numbers that are, uh, that are connected um, to your um, individual IDs, you're in deep trouble. In fact, there are other kinds of things that can be done. Like, for instance, there, there are these attacks called phone porting, where um, imagine if I use this to actually identify, to get the uh, phone number of some famous politician, right? If they have their email ID, I get their phone numbers. In fact, there are these attacks called phone porting. Once you know the mobile number of particular people, you can actually call up the operator and give them other kinds of information to change uh, their phone numbers to something else. In fact, this has been carried out on very famous politicians in the US. So it is actually very dangerous to enable these kinds of linking of um, different types of PIIs that, that uh, you have. Now, so far, I seem to, there was one assumption that I made, which is that the audience size estimates are going to be precise, right? But it turns out that it's actually not the case. Um, Facebook is not completely dumb. Um, it is dumb, as I'm going to show, but it's not completely dumb. So we actually reverse engineered how the audience size estimates work, because as I've shown, as I've described at a high level before, if the audience size estimates were exact, then your problem is solved very easily. It actually turns out that Facebook does two checks. The first thing is, it does not give any estimates when the list, when the number of audience that you uploaded is less than 20. That means if I just uploaded Ram's email ID, it won't give me an estimate. But if I included 20 more email IDs from here, once the size of that list increases to more than 20, then it gives an estimate. And the second thing it does is it rounds the estimates. But the way in which it rounds the estimates is if the number of um, email IDs or phone numbers that I upload to target people, if it is less than 1,000, it rounds it to the closest 10. If it, that means it computes the exact estimate, um, exact match uh, size, and then it rounds it to the closest 10. If it is less, if it's between 1,000 and 10,000, it rounds it to the closest 100 and so on, okay? So there is some rounding error that it does. Now the question is, is this rounding of estimates, is this noise of um, estimates, audience estimates, is it sufficient to thwart the attack that we, that I was describing that could be done with exact size estimates? The answer turns out to be no. Uh, to give you a, re a feel for why this is the case, suppose you have a customer list of size, uh, customer list S, right? And then you have a user, a new user, and a PIA of the user, like phone number or email ID. Now, what I'm going to do, what you could do, is you take the, um, you take the customer list S of some size, you upload it, you see the estimate, and then you create another customer list with that, size, with that list S, plus you add this new user email, and then you upload S plus U, right? And you look at what size estimate you get. Now, you can check whether the audience reach or the audience uh, size estimate for S plus U is more than S. Now, if the audience size estimate is higher, then you know that user U is on Facebook, right? But if it isn't, if the audience size estimate is the same, then the confusion that you have with the rounding is that you don't know whether U is on Facebook or whether U is not on Facebook, or whether, it is, whether this information got lost because of rounding error, right? Now, but then, if you think of the probability of a rounding error happening, if your, size, if your list S is actually between size 20 and 1,000, then the rounding error probability is 0.9. Um, the chance of you uh, getting the confusing signal in the second case is 0.9, um, and that's in, in part because you'll be rounded to the closest 10. Now, but when you create K lists, when you start creating more and more lists with audience reach or size between 20 and 1,000, you start noticing that the probability of this confusion coming up because of this rounding error starts to decrease exponentially. It starts to decrease with the number of lists that you create. Like if you create K lists, then the rounding error probability is 0.9 power K. So if you actually created 1,000 or, or 100 of these lists, then the chance of rounding error confusing you is actually becomes vanishingly small. In, f in fact, you have a 99.9969 um, probability that you can exactly infer whether or not um, the person is on Facebook. In other words, to step back, because I know I realize that I'm, I'm going quite fast here, by 
the problem that we're trying to solve is whether the rounding error is sufficiently creating enough noise um, and enough confusion to dissuade you from actually drawing um, the inferences that you want to draw. And the point that, uh, and all this argument is to show that you can actually, um, you can actually eliminate the confusion that comes because of the rounding by just creating 100 lists. Um, now, the question is how to create such customer lists? It turns out it's actually quite simple because as long as you have some list of email IDs or some phone numbers or some public voter ID records in the US, you can easily construct any number of lists that you want from them. So in fact, to validate this, what we actually did was we actually carried out the entire attack and we demonstrated that within less than 30 minutes, if you give us an email ID, we can actually infer your phone number. So one of the students actually com completely implemented the attack uh, and showed um, that for multiple users in US, Germany, and France, it's just a matter of half an hour. Like if you had given us, uh, in, if you give us an email ID of anyone who signed up on Facebook with that email ID, we could find their phone numbers. Um, whatever it is. Like it, this includes for any politician or, or any famous person or things like that. Now, thankfully, um, it took us about a few, five to six months and a letter from the data protection agencies in Germany and France to get Facebook to um, fix the problem. Uh, and so now they actually fixed the problem. Uh, but the fix that they deployed was one where whenever, so previously what they were doing, the, the whole reason why the attack was possible was because if your email ID and phone number or any other kind of personal information linked to the same record, they were counting it as one. And they were essentially, by doing that, they're actually leaking information. So the fix was to actually um, not um, allow creation of any custom list that actually includes different types of PIIs. So starting last week or so, um, you cannot um, basically create custom lists where part of them are phone numbers and part of them are email IDs and so on. So to quickly wrap up in terms of open challenges, so what I talked about was, was a very specific attack on Facebook ad APIs. But if you step back, the online ad APIs are increasingly becoming very, very feature rich and very, very complex. Um, in fact, I sp spoke about two methods of targeting users. Actually, there are more, um, even on Facebook. And in fact, Facebook ad interface might have many more vulnerabilities. We don't know. Um, in fact, um, if I were to guess, there are probably many more than of the type of attacks that we pointed out than uh, what we discovered. And Facebook is actually just one of several online ad platforms out there. There is Google, there is Twitter, and each of them have their own set of ad APIs where they're basically allowing advertisers to probe at users um, in various different ways. Now here is the open challenge. How can we systematically analyze data broker ad APIs for privacy vulnerabilities? I think this is a problem uh, that is technically hard, um, and you might even need to formally model um, the information leakage through these ad APIs to understand this. So to summarize, um, I wanted to, actually in this talk, what I was hoping was to get more people to look at ad targeting um, broadly online and particularly on social media. And this is how most of these companies, internet companies today make their revenues, right? Or, or, or uh, the revenue models are completely dependent on them. But these companies are gathering tremendous amount of data about individual users and they're making it available uh, for anybody else, any advertiser um, can look at that data, of course, through narrow APIs um, for a price. And this raises a number of different types of concerns that are related to transparency, control, fairness, and privacy. Um, and while we did do some preliminary work in the space, um, uh, most of it is are papers that are actually pointing out how complicated the problems are related to each of these issues, but we actually haven't barely scratch the surface in terms of solutions. So my hope is that some of you would be interested in picking up on these open challenges. And with that, I'll conclude the talk. Fantastic, uh, Fantastic. thank you, Krishna. Um, let's open it up for questions. I'm sure there'll be questions. Uh, let's go with the lady here first. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit about the behavior, behavioral features that you as an ad uh, agency can give to Facebook? Like what behavioral features can you select? And as a user, what I can select in my manage ads? Yes. Uh, so here is the simple answer to that question. When you go to Facebook, 
um, when you log into Facebook the next time, just look at the bottom left-hand corner. There is a thing called ads. Just click on that ads thing. It will, you have to click two more buttons saying that you want to run ads, and that's it. You'll, you will be signed up as an advertiser. Facebook makes it super easy for anyone to sign up as an advertiser. Once you sign up as an advertiser, you can go to an interface. You'll be shown an interface like this. Um, let me just show that. So you'll see an interface uh, like this. So here, notice, look at this. This is detailed targeting says, and it says include people who match at least one of the following ad demographic interests and behaviors, right? So you just, there is a thing called browse over there, right? You click on the browse button, it'll show you every single feature that you could use to target people with. So actually, if there is one other high level, uh, high order bit um, that was a realization for us is, um, we often looked at, I've done a number of studies of social media, but I was always, I never looked at social, uh, I always was gathering information about users, crawling information about users and so on. What we completely missed was the best way we could get information was to sign up as an advertiser. Because once you sign up as an advertiser, Facebook will open all the data they have about users because you're going to pay them money. But if you don't and you try to uh, dwindle around trying to gather information, that's much harder. So it's just follow the money kind of a principle. Okay, uh, let's take the question from uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, So Facebook, what, uh, so in one of the papers we also talk about what data you can ask Facebook to delete and what you can't. Um, so actually it turns out you can ask them to delete certain information that Facebook has inferred, uh, but when you cannot, there is no easy way to ask Facebook to delete the information they're getting from data brokers, like when they match your records to Axiom or those other kinds of things, right? So if you want those records to be deleted, you need to go to the data source of Axiom and, and, um, and uh, Experian and those kinds of companies and then delete them, uh, delete the data over there before, you, um, before Facebook will delete its linkage with that, with that data source. Now, I think the data protection laws are significantly stronger in Europe. Uh, and in fact, to get Facebook to acknowledge the privacy attack that we talked about, we, needed, we actually demonstrated it to the French and German data protection agencies. And the moment they sent a letter to Facebook, they got back to us. But prior to that, they weren't. <laughs> so in, in Europe, actually, there, there are very strong data protection laws. And the hope is that uh, that's what would get these companies to react. Yeah, so, so you showed uh, why, for all the reasons why targeting is a perverse thing. Uh, would we rather than be flooded with ads which are not relevant to us, presumably for keeping Facebook free, they have to show a certain number of ads. So would we rather not be targeted and see a huge flurry of ads which are not relevant to us? Or put another way, are we willing to put a premium and say, I don't want to be targeted, I'm willing to pay a certain premium for use of your services? Yeah. So the, just to make sure that um, while the talk might have been, so I'm actually, I'm actually not, uh, first of all, I'm not the authority to talk about what's the right, uh, I have my own opinions, but I'm not, but I'm sure that different people have different opinions on what, to what extent targeting should be allowed. And, but I just want to point out that I actually, uh, the, I, hopefully the talk is, didn't come across as against ad targeting as much as thinking about issues related to ad targeting, like transparency control and other kinds of things that need to be taken care of um, when, uh, when people can target ads um, using personal data, right? So I don't think ad targeting per se is bad, uh, but the thing is when you're doing that kind of targeting, it naturally raises a number of different types of concerns. And, the, and if you don't address the privacy concern, fairness concerns, and these other kinds of things like transparency and control, I fear that um, this, the ad targeting could be very easily abused. Uh, that's, the way I, that, that's the way we're looking at it. So if I may ask one question, and we'll take one last question, and then we can go to the break after that. So uh, my question, again, I don't work in this space. Um, how much work is going on? So a lot of this is being targeted because of vulnerabilities in the APIs, and you have so much personal information. Are there agents that will create fake information on your behalf effectively to thwart 
I mean, instead of trying to solve the API problem, can you just inject noise in your own social media data in a systematic way? And would that be a better way of tackling the problem? So that might be a way of, first of all, um, when Facebook is linking um, your online data with offline data, there is a limit to the number of fake identities you can create. Because imagine, actually, that's an one way to think of this is it's very easy to create a fake Facebook ID, but it's very difficult to create a fake Axiom or Experian ID because that would mean that you have to go to your bank and do a whole bunch of other stuff. So first of all, Facebook can easily in, uh, figure out where the fake identities might be by the way of actually linking to offline data, right? That's one thing. And having said that, the, that kind of approaches might work um, in terms of privacy issues, right? But notice that privacy is only one of the different types of concerns. You still have the concern about discriminatory ad targeting to users broadly. And then there is this whole other concern related to explanations right. and how to explain why you are receiving some kind of a service, um, which is particularly, which is interesting even in the context of ads, but also it's a much more broader and general question because in Europe, um, there are uh, government regulators pushing for every online service to actually provide automatic explanations whenever the service is personalized, right? And ads is just one, ad targeting is just one form of personalized service, but you have personalization in search, you have personalization in recommendations, and every one of them needs to give explanations of some sort uh, for why they're being personalized. And many of the issues that are raised about standards for explanations, whether it is complete, con uh, consistent, correct, all these issues would come up even in right. those kinds right. of scenarios. Right. And the hope is that if we solve this in the ad space, then maybe there are ideas here that we could export to other scenarios as well. Got it, thank you. We'll take one last question. Yes, please. Uh, I think you hit uh, the nail on the head in terms of what's the core problem with explanations, which is this huge information asymmetry. And, um, I d the, and in some sense, you need explanations because of the I information asymmetry problem. And um, I guess the challenge is actually figuring out, and I, don't, I haven't fully figured this out myself, um, what role explanations I mean, in some sense, explanations are, are, are a fix to that, in, that problem, the big gap. But in terms of how they should bridge the gap, because I don't think the explanations would completely make the, so, uh, would make the playing field even and make information available to all people, because that's not good either, right? Because explanations themselves can lead to other kinds of privacy issues. Um, and this is a space that is very complicated. And uh, we've been thinking about this, but we actually, I don't have a very good answer for how, how explanations should fix that information asymmetry problem. Okay, I think you know, there's a lot more questions that you can possibly take at the break. So I just wanted to once again uh, thank Krishna. I think we should all give him a huge round of applause. <laughs> very interesting topic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of you know, more paparazzi style interactions with you. So we'll have. Yeah, for getting Ram's phone number, he's handing out prizes. So thank you again. And I also wanted to call Sridhar uh, Vardarajan. So you, do, you get, don't get just one memento. You get two. Uh, <laughs> you guys want to uh, come here for a quick picture?